Hello everybody, I hope wherever you are today, you're currently in a good mood. And if you're not, I hope that in some small way, this video can help put a little bit of a smile on your face, because making it has put a big one on mine. You see, thanks to the fact that many people are just like you have chosen to follow me on this crazy journey over the last six years, I have been able to live a life I never thought possible and realize some of my childhood dreams. Quite a few of them, actually. In fact, up until the other day, for the last month, I have been using this as my daily driver, a gorgeous classic V12 manual Ferrari 550 Maranello, that thanks to all of you, I can call my gorgeous classic Ferrari 550 Maranello. However, for the last few days, I've given the keys to the Ferrari up for something that I think any self-respecting 10-year-old would find far more exciting. And come on now, adults, you can admit it too. I know you're gonna be jealous of this one. This is an LEVC TX Electric, or as it's known to most, it's the current generation of the venerable London Black Cab. Before we get started proper, I'm sure a few of you are wondering about my new style, this. I'm fairly well known for my large collection of caps, but equally well known for not actually wearing any of them. What's changed? Well, I wanted to raise a little bit of awareness because this has a very special meaning for me. It's from the podcast Having a Ball, run by two of my old film school buddies, Joseph Barnes and Andreas Anyhow, a dynamic duo if ever there were one, and constantly the light of my time at film school. Unfortunately, about a year or two ago, Joseph was diagnosed with testicular cancer. Joseph being Joseph, he wanted to deal with things his way, through the medium of comedy. So him and Andrea set up the podcast, Having a Ball, to discuss the entire process from start to whatever the finish was in their own way. In other words, having a laugh. Joseph even recorded a special short action film with his drip as a prop. I can't really imagine many other people doing that. As you might imagine, it's not a particularly child-friendly podcast, but if somebody close to you is experiencing something like this, I found it to be a really useful, helpful, and on occasion, very entertaining way of dealing with some of the realities of life, and tragically, death too. My heart absolutely goes out to the pair of guys, and I have masses of respect for both of them for dealing with these things in what I can only imagine is the best way possible. And guys, I, I really hope I get to see you both soon at some point, because... Uh, I do miss the pair of you. Anyway, on to the video. Check this out. Driving this around has been not just entertaining because of the novelty factor, but it's also provided me with a real and quite refreshing challenge. First off, this is a truly iconic vehicle, and it's achieved that status despite being relatively rare and highly specialised. I suppose the closest American equivalent might be the Ford Crown Vic, known to many as the classic New York yellow taxi. However, that in of itself isn't a particularly rare car, and it's also converted. They weren't built specifically to be a taxi. They're perhaps equally as well known as an old school American cop car. But this is, was, and will always be, first and foremost, a London cab. There are probably only tens of thousands of them in the entire world, but show a picture of one to nearly anyone, car person or otherwise, and they'll recognize it. Somebody in Melbourne would know what this is. Somebody in Dubai would know what this is. Somebody in America would know what this is. It's a London cab, a black hack, although this one is red. This has also forced a change of tactics. You see, generally speaking, when I get a press car in, one of the greatest challenges is trying to take account of all the different possible usages of that car, the differing scenarios, needs, and desires that people have. One car, after all, is rarely designed for just one job. But here it is. This is a car built for one very explicit need. In other words, you've got one job, damn it. Therefore, absolutely everything that I talk about today is taking account of the fact that this is a vehicle designed for one explicit purpose. So let's talk about that then, shall we? Let's take the shape of it. This is instantly recognizable as a London cab, and that's significant. Firstly, it's a design classic, and you don't mess with the classic. What LEVC have done here to update the cab, I think, is perfect, and how these things should be treated. But more importantly than that, I think in an urban environment like London, it's important to be able to spot a utility vehicle like this by shape alone, not requiring significant signage or even a garish paint scheme. 
And this is of particular importance in London, where taxis are a very specific thing. A London taxi cab is sacred for several reasons. First off, drivers must pass the gruelling and infamous test that is the knowledge. This means they have to memorise all of the streets in the area that they cover. Yes, all of them. And this is a process that can take years. But it means if you hop into one of these, whatever time of day it is, if you have to get from A to B, your driver can take you the quickest and most efficient way without having to use a sat-nav. Particularly important in a built-up and urban area like London. A licensed taxi cab is also only allowed to charge the price as dictated to them by TFL, meaning that all else being equal, the same journey in two different vehicles will cost exactly the same. These are also the only vehicle you're allowed to jump into without pre-booking. If you want anything else, you have to book it in advance and you should have to negotiate the price too. Though in recent years, services like Uber and Lyft have sought to blur the lines between taxi cab and private hire. Now, in principle, I have actually only one real gripe with this, and that is that you would expect something called the TX Electric, made by the London Electric Vehicle Company, with electric taxi written down the side, to be all electric. In modern parlance, a BEV, so no combustion engine whatsoever. But that's not actually true at all, because under here you will find a one and a half litre Volvo derived three cylinder turbocharged petrol engine. But in the company's defense, that engine will never directly turn the rear wheels. This is a range extender vehicle. So what you have is a 31 kilowatt hour usable battery pack that gives you a pure EV range of between 60 and 80 miles. Then if you've depleted that, the petrol engine can kick in to make sure that you've still got power. At all times, drive comes courtesy of a 150 horsepower electric motor. Worth noting though, that the engine will never top up the battery. It will never fill it, simply maintain it wherever it is. To charge this then, you do need to plug it in. And handily, that's not too difficult. Behind this annoyingly flimsy and rather awkward door, you will find the modern Type 2 and CCS connector, giving you fast and slow charge capability. Then, in a stroke of genius, over here, you've also got the older Shadowmo connector. This is optional, but I think very helpful because it means whatever charging station you turn up at, you should be able to use it. At the back, you will find a boot, though it's not particularly useful, only just about big enough for the spare wheel and a couple of knickknacks for the driver. Like I said, this is a vehicle designed for a very specific need, not just a job, but also a place too. So everything about it has been set up for the needs of the London cabbie. That drivetrain is set up to work so that you can do more or less all the miles you should need to on pure electric power. After all, 80 miles in London is a fair way, but your cabbie does not have time to sit around charging it, so the petrol engine can kick in to make sure that when you need to, you can keep going. The fuel tank is reasonably small at about 36 litres, but even so, you can complete at least 250 to 300 miles in this between having to fill up everything. The TX Electric replaced the older TX4, which had been in service from 2007 until 2017. This arrived just in time. It was a ground up all new design, not just to meet the requirements of its owners, operators and passengers, but the local government too. Because for 2018 onwards, London stipulated that any new taxi cabs being registered had to be capable of driving pure zero emissions which this is. The TX Electric is also noticeably larger than its predecessor by about a foot in length. It's built on a chassis made out of aluminium extrusions bonded together in a very high-tech all-new factory over at Coventry, just down the road from where the old one was assembled. They also produce a van version too, spun off essentially the same platform. The major difference being, of course, this has a lot more glass and also more seats. Depending on specification, you're going to find either five or, as here, six of them. And in keeping with the 21st century ethos, this is also a very accessible cab. The door is tall with a very low step. It opens out quite wide, though I have been told in Scotland this can prove problematic because the door itself is therefore very large and can be caught by the odd gust of wind. However, it is a very nice place to spend your time. You can really get six adults in here. And I have. They were comfortable. I believe they had a good time. Accessibility is also key here. After all, from a basic perspective, you never want to have to turn a fare down because they can't get in your cab, and you want to make sure that your passengers also have the best experience. So, there is a hearing aid loop installed. In order to be a London taxi, your cab must be wheelchair accessible. For this purpose, the TXE is offered with a built-in wheelchair ramp. 
It is also a requirement in order to qualify for the nationwide £7,500 plug-in taxi grant. So, this top-of-the-line Vista Comfort Plus has that as standard, but for £800 you can also add it to the base icon. That costs £800, but the grant is worth £7,500, so you'd be daft really not to. After the grant, the price of the entry-level vehicle is around £58,000 to £59,000, this about £65,000. And of course, as you might imagine, as the top of the line model, it has a few more luxuries. As you might imagine, luxury features in something like a cab mean something very different to many of the other vehicles that I feature. But what do you have here? Well, you've got this beautiful panoramic sunroof that I think will really enhance the experience for passengers, particularly, say, for a Christmas drive down Regent Street. You've also got power sockets everywhere. There's 13 amp ones down here with a 150 watt limit. You have an intercom so that you can talk with the driver. You also have vinyl covered seats in place of the regular clock. In fact, LEVC have also partnered with Clive Sutton, so if you want something really quite swish, you can have it. You also have plenty of lighting for passengers in the second and third row, and I suspect of great importance, a big clear screen here, giving your passengers a little bit more privacy, and also protecting you if they want to get a little bit rowdy. But this is the boring bit of the cab, isn't it? This is the bit that you've all seen already. The exciting bit is up there, the cockpit. LEVC are owned by Gili, the same people behind Volvo and now Lotus, a bit of Aston Martin and AMG as well. So, as a result, most of what you see and touch in here is the same as you'd find in many a Volvo. But again, this is why I have to look at things a very different way. Because were this a £65,000 Volvo 4x4, I'd be heavily criticising it for the fact that the driver's seat is cloth, the rear ones are a different material, and not only is the steering wheel not even leather, it's plastic plastic in fact that really is the order of the day plastic is everywhere around this big central console here which is again lifted straight from a volvo but because this is a taxi that's not a bad thing it's plastic because it's hard wearing and durable easy to clean if you get it messy with whatever taxis get messy with so this is not really inherently a bad thing I like the fact that the centre console is angled heavily towards you, makes it feel like a very driver orientated place. And indeed, LEVC tell me that this is the most driver orientated cab they have ever made. Though, as I have absolutely no experience whatsoever of the old TX4, I am left to guess exactly what they mean by that. The driving area is actually a little bit more cramped than I had expected. The seat does have electric adjustment, but the overall room for it isn't that great. Handily, your average cabbie now is a very health conscious and fairly slender individual, so getting in shouldn't be a problem for them. The seat is also at a fairly generous height, so if you are in the highly unlikely event suffering back issues, you shouldn't really have a problem getting in and out on a day to day basis. Luckily, said seat is actually quite comfortable. Over longer periods, I found it to be pretty good, which is essential as, let's face it, you are going to spend a long time in here if you get in here at all. I also have really no gripes whatsoever with any of the switch gear. In fact, my sole piece of feedback to LEVC on that front would be the fact that I think the dedicated EV mode should be a proper physical button rather than having to go through a couple of touchscreens. This is functionality that I think in the coming years is going to become ever more important. So getting to it quickly and easily, I think should be a simple task. That aside though, I think LEVC have done a fairly good job of accommodating for the needs of the 21st century cabbie. So, in here you have enough storage space for either a modern day mobile phone or the cabbie's modern diet, which includes of course Greg's sausage rolls, Greg's vegan sausage rolls and Ginster's sausage rolls, a wide variety. Next to that you have what looks like a very over-engineered and heavy-duty accessory bar that currently is only supporting the small and lightweight cup holder, the perfect size for the one and only refreshment any cabbie will ever need. The sound system up front I think is not quite as good as it should be on account of the fact you do listen to it all day long and it has to be EQ'd to death to produce an acceptable noise. However, it does have AM, FM and DAB capable of tuning into both stations, LBC and Magic. Down there, in place of a passenger seat, you also have essentially a void in which you can store whatever it is that you want. Here I've got a selection of all of the 21st century cabbies' varied reading materials. The lack of a passenger seat up front is the result of a legal requirement for the cab to have space for passenger luggage. As there is none in the boot, that is the solution. Putting it next to the driver is also safer for the occupants and makes it easier to access on a busy street. Standing beside a vehicle on the path is much safer than standing behind it. 
All in all then, like most modern things, it's better and bigger than the last one. It's a reinvention of a classic icon done well. In fact, my largest problem this whole week has been the fact it's so iconic, people completely ignore the fact that all of the plates at the back are blank, showing you that this is not a licensed taxi cab. I can't pick someone up, I'll likely get arrested. Somebody actually tried to get in this yesterday, and as I don't really want to be done for kidnapping, I need to make sure that that does not happen again. In fact, I'm pretty certain that the only way to avoid any potentially hilarious misunderstandings going forward is to put up some signage clearly demonstrating the fact that this is not a real taxi. If I put fake taxi on the side of it, I don't think anybody could possibly misunderstand what this is all about. I'm sure you'll agree. So that's what the taxi is. What is it actually like to drive? Let's find out. Now, if you're like me, I bet there's one thing about a London cab you do know. It's a legendary turning circle. But just how good is it? Well, as we're in an empty car park, let's find out, shall we? Gonna turn forwards to then do full right lock okay here we go now most cars i just could not turn around here just can't be done even ones are pretty generous turning circles yeah it's really good it's really really good let's try that again and around we go it really does feel like this thing's barely going any further forward than where its rear wheels already are anyway onto the road All jokes aside, my time this week has only served to add to the massive admiration I already possessed for London's cabbies. They really are heroes. And to be honest, next time I'm in London, I'm not gonna get anything else. I mentioned earlier they also make a van version of this, and truthfully, that's probably for a good reason, because this drives very much like a van. In fact, as a van, and I suppose in some ways as a taxi, there's only really one major failing. Despite the fact it sits on an aluminium chassis, it's very heavy. This is 2.2 tonnes, which for what is essentially an empty box is a lot. The Audi RS e-tron GT that I drove a few weeks ago was 2.3 tonnes and that was an all-electric car with a big battery, a very healthy range, lots of power, more motors and all of the luxury stuff you get in a top-end £135,000 car. Well, apart from 360-degree cameras and soft-closed doors, but that's a problem for that review. This doesn't seem to possess anywhere near the amount of toys you'd expect for a car weighing that much, nor is it actually that big. Sure, it feels it and you sit very high, but it's 4.8 and a bit meters long. That's not huge. For context, a sort of short wheelbase executive car is around the sort of five meter area, 5.1 maybe, and something like a long wheelbase seven series, about 5.3 meters. That's a very big car. So in terms of space efficiency, considering this is a proper seven-seater, ignoring the fact it has very little luggage space, it's actually pretty good. It also highlights what I have said many times about the fact that in a city center, an EV is the perfect thing. And because this is a range extender, unlike the more traditional plugins that I've experienced recently, there isn't a single difference in performance, regardless of whether the engine is turning or not. And you know something, performance is actually pretty decent. At no real point in time have I ever felt shortchanged by this, except in one very particular and rather crucial scenario, and that's when you're pulling away at a junction. In fact, as we have a clear piece of road, allow me to demonstrate. You come to a standstill, imagine you're in London traffic, you're waiting for a break, and you go, oh, there it is, put your foot down. That's fully down, by the way, that's that foot absolutely pinned. And now we're moving. This has caught me out a few times. One of the strengths of an EV is the fact that they should really give you everything pretty much straight away. Yet for whatever reason, I really don't know what it is, maybe longevity of the motor or taking it easier on the batteries, I don't know, this takes some time to get going. That is a problem, particularly for your London cabbie. After all, I recently read a report in um, the Times, I think it was, where they surveyed a thousand London cabbies and over 600 of them had the middle name 
dangerous. So for them, I think it's absolutely crucial that a car can just nip out into traffic at any point in time. I keep calling this a car on occasion. Is it a car? I don't know. It's not a van. It's probably not really a car. I mean, it is just a taxi, isn't it? That's what it is. It is a black hack. For my viewers abroad, by the way, that's short for Hackney Carriage, a designation for licensed vehicles in the London area. Once you are up to speed, things really are fine. No, it's not stellar performance, but I didn't really expect that. It has a top speed of over 70, so that really is more than enough. And I've done a lot of miles on the motorway where it's actually been a fairly pleasant thing. Wind noise can be a little bit intrusive because of the styling, though lately it has been unusually blustery. But ride comfort is good, regardless of whether you're empty or full. The steering also has a surprising amount of feel, not exactly going to win any awards, but particularly at higher speed, 60 and 70, it's actually a lot heavier than you might expect. Around town it turns quick enough, gives you the adjustability that you would want, and you can place it with reasonable accuracy. You can see plenty of that bonnet, and as you've already witnessed, if you can find one, you can turn this on a sixpence. Visibility for most of this is really good. A head fine, over here fine, side fine, rear three quarters fine, a little bit distorted by this little protective shield here, but it's okay. You can see if there is or isn't something. But the B pillar here is quite intrusive. Considering how often you'll have to sort of, you know, turn and do that, it's just a, a little bit frustrating. On occasion, I've thought maybe the wing mirrors could perhaps help a little bit, be a touch bigger, a bit more generous, but if you look at them, they've been styled very deliberately. I like that they're just cut off at the edges. They haven't been made to look flashy at the expense of making the whole thing a little bit bigger. This is a vehicle with a job to do. Also, how many jets come out to clear this screen? That's unreal. Though known as a London cab, the TXE is sold around the world, often in shuttle guise, which is missing the taxi signage and a few other bits. The old TX4 is still in service in the capital, but regulations mean no new ones can be registered. Today, some 41% of the cabs in London are the new TXE. Obviously, for the people that usually occupy this seat, it's as much office as anything else. But for me, it has just been a really fun experience. In fact, I've been appreciating a little bit of the old Ogmios Zen school of motoring here. Because you don't really have much performance, instead you simply find yourself just enjoying the drive. The only thing getting in the way of my Zen this week has been the fact that many a road user doesn't seem to respect the cab all that much. In fact, I think they're trying to take advantage of the fact they assume it's a slow vehicle, or one that's going to stop imminently, because I have witnessed far more than my fair share of stupid and aggressive driving while I've been at the helm of this. And that's just one of the reasons I now have just a touch more appreciation for cabbies. On the flip side, I have also had far more than my fair share of people allowing me out at a junction. There's also, it turns out, an equal number of people that do have a lot of respect for the job that somebody's got to do. You'll notice the TX also has plenty of sidewall on the tyres, designed to cope with all of the demands of London's roads, the odd pothole and the like. Also helping you keep on the road for as long as possible is the fact service intervals are annual or 25,000 miles. Your standard warranty is four years or 100,000 miles, and that can be upgraded to five years for not that much more. These are, of course, available in a number of different shades. I actually quite like the red. It stands out, but as mentioned, it's the shape of these which makes them iconic. So you can really have it in whatever colour you like, people are still going to know what it is. For those not living in London or that adults like me, you do actually have a basic navigation system, though sadly no Android Auto or Apple CarPlay. Though this has no real gears to speak of, you do of course still have a gear lever and it operates more or less the same way as in a Volvo. That means you generally have to double click if you want to go from drive to reverse, so you can't just push it through, you've got to press, press. I think that's probably a safety thing and you do get used to it. If you click it from side to side, you'll engage a level of regenerative braking. I did play around with it in full recovery mode earlier and it seemed somewhat inconsistent. I thought it was near a one pedal drive mode for a bit, but then it suddenly just stopped braking on its own, which is quite disconcerting. According to LEVC, if the petrol power is running all the time, in other words, your battery is depleted, your MPG is going to be around something like 36.7. I haven't managed to find out or calculate the efficiency that I'm getting from the EV side of things, but I did do some basic maths. And assuming you're getting between 60 and 80 miles out of a charge using only the battery, no petrol power, and your electricity is costing you anywhere between sort of 35 and 70 pence per kilowatt hour, which I appreciate is a broad 
broad range, but also represents the broad range of costs it's going to be to charge this, you're looking at somewhere between about 10 and 30 pence a mile in terms of EV expenditure. Drawbacks then? Well, yeah, there are a few. The heater, that's the big one for me. It's useless. I've gotten into this thing a few mornings at about six or seven o'clock when it's been only about five or six degrees outside. And it's taken, I'd say, about half an hour for this thing actually to get up to temperature, up until which point it's been absolutely freezing. I have a theory that what's going on is it's only heating when the petrol engine is in play, which it doesn't do all that often by default. So it's taking a while to get warm. Same for the AC. I got into it yesterday and it was very warm. Took a little while for it to cool down. It can warm you up and it can cool you nicely. It just seems to take its time doing either. This has a heated front screen, so you can at least clear that. The side mirror is also a heated, as is the rear screen. So you can get on the move, no trouble at all. You'll just be chilly. The powertrain also is absolutely fine. I have no issues with it, barring the fact I'd like a little bit more poke at junctions. However, it is, like many hybrids, just a touch awkward. I'm glad that it's got more usable range than many other plugins. 60 to 80 miles is decent, particularly in London. But to charge it takes a while. I plugged this into a fast charge ahead of this review because overnight something went wrong, so it didn't charge and it was only taking charge at about 30 kilowatts, which is not as quick as it says it can. It was going to take about an hour and a half to get from 25% to full. That is a long time to give you what would have worked out at the equivalent of only about 40 miles of range, and your average cabbie just can't wait around. Okay, you could say, yeah, sure, then you can use the petrol engine, but what about if you're somewhere like Oxford, which currently is planning to try and eliminate combustion engines full stop from some of its roads? To me, it would be logical to offer a pure BEV option in the TXE, but again, this is an area where LEVC tell me the current setup has been designed specifically to fit the needs of the London cabbie. In essence, the 300 miles of city range that you get is likely enough for most regular days, but the 300 mile full range would also allow you to perform that once a month trip to Birmingham or a faraway airport that some cabbies get. These are rare, but lucrative fares, and nobody wants to turn them down. I tell you what, as I'm reversing now, we're on some pretty loose ground, and I think I owe it to all of us to try something. Uh, it's a Volvo at heart, so it's probably not going to do it, but yeah, no. ESC off is not ESC off. Honestly, I'm kind of surprised, maybe it's happened already and I just haven't noticed, that nobody hasn't taken one of these, put an LS up the front, stuck some bucket seats in the back with harnesses and turned one of these into a drift taxi. I mean, it's rear wheel drive with mad steering lock out of the gates. It's born for it. It'd be brilliant. Actually, dial up the electric motors and it'd still be ace. I have also found the intercom to be a little bit lacklustre. If you're driving around at low speeds, you can hear your passengers just fine, but at higher speeds, you can't. And as far as I can tell, there is no volume control for it. Luckily, people only ever ask you two questions anyway as a cabbie, so you can just see their lips moving and answer. All right, mate. Been busy? Uh, yeah, 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 pretty, pretty busy, yeah. What time are you on till, mate? Uh, I'm clocking off after this, actually. I'm going home. I appreciate this is more of a, an annoyance rather than an actual fault. But the brakes in this, I think, are hydraulically or pneumatically operated because there's a brake booster up front that is constantly making a racket. All the time it's sat there going And it's just, it's just not that pleasant. Let's see if I can get it to do it for you. You probably won't hear it. But, you know what? I've had an absolutely brilliant time. I've really, really enjoyed this. It's been so fun. This is such a special thing. I mean, I think this exists in the same category as, you know, fire engines, ambulances, police cars, like any, any kid or kid at heart would just want to go in one of these. They just would. And if you happen to be not from London or indeed the United Kingdom, I'd love to know what vehicle it is that you think of when you first imagine a taxi cab. Because anyone says taxi to me, and this is what I think of.
They're legendary. They're brilliant. Known the world over. This is an iconic vehicle. This, to me, can stand proud alongside things like the Mini, the 2CV, the Beetle. It's brilliant. I love it. It keeps our nation's capital going. And it turns like that. <laughs> oh, no. Oh. I was hoping it wouldn't come to this. Like Superman, the cab is almost impervious to obstacles. But it has one weakness. That's a river. I'm north of it. Mm, and it's just gone six. I can't, I can't go over that. Oh well. Just as well. Time to go home then. Thanks to you all for watching. Hope you've enjoyed this. Don't forget to like, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already. And I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye. Cabby ho!